Talos Morel, who was supposed to who was supposed to host this meeting, but due to personal problems, she, she cannot be here. And she sends her um, apologies and greetings. And I'm delighted uh, to have to, you know, to take up this responsibility and welcome you. Um, we're very honored to have you here, uh, Chris and Gabor. Um, Chris Han, who is a, uh, welcome who is a renowned um, social anthropologist, professor emeritus, uh, director of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, uh, with research interests in economic organization, property relations, civil society, ethnicity, and nationalism. And we have our other uh, distinguished scholar here, Gabor Schering, who is a political economist, currently a Marie Curie fellow at Bocconi University and uh, who's working on the political economic determinants of inequality in health and well-being, um, and how these shape democracy and capitalist diversity. Uh, my name is Noemi Gonda. I'm a researcher here at the Division of uh, Rural Development, uh, um, Department of Urban and Rural Development, uh, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And here are my colleagues here in the room and also uh, on the screen. Um, here at the division, we are an interdisciplinary team doing research, uh, broadly speaking, on social environmental politics across the global south and north. And our interests span from questions of climate change, gender, de-agrarization, uh, fisheries, um, mining, authoritarian populism, state making, migration, among many other uh, things. So the floor is yours, uh, Chris and uh, Gabor. I, if you want to you know, expand on your presentation, on your introduction, please do so. Uh, and we're going to have a total of uh, 40, 45 minutes of presentation and then uh, a lively debate, hopefully. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Noemi. And let me begin by greeting you. Good afternoon from Cambridge. Uh, I'm very sorry that Ildiko is not able to take part. Uh, I don't know her personally, but I was very pleased to receive this invitation, as Gabor was. And we agreed it would make sense to schedule this talk shortly after the Hungarian elections. Uh, that took place just a couple of weeks back. Um, in order to dig a little deeper into the Hungarian case, particularly the rural sector, because I take it that is the priority of your community, the list of topics that you just mentioned, I think are they're almost all relevant to Hungary, with the possible exception of fisheries. Um, Hungary is not so strong on fishing, but everything else seems relevant. I'm also privileged to be doing this session this afternoon with Gabor, who was a guest here in Cambridge just a short time ago uh, at the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies. We organized a panel on Victor Orban's Hungary. And it was great fun to do that together. And I would like all, you to know also, because he's too modest to mention it himself, Gabor was awarded the association's major prize this year for his book, a retreat of liberal democracy. He can say more about the book later, but uh, yes, it was uh, very good to welcome Gabor in Cambridge, back in Cambridge, because of course his PhD was from Cambridge not so many years ago. I think we complement each other. We're obviously from different generations. I'm the outsider, so to speak, because I had to learn Hungarian as an adult. Uh, Gabor is the native who is now pursuing a very international career. Uh, he is coming more from sociology, Political economy, you said, uh, certainly that's there, that's strong, uh, political science. Um, he's genuinely interdisciplinary, whereas I'm a very simple field working anthropologist and I've been working in the same Hungarian village since the mid 1970s when I gathered data for my doctoral thesis. It's a village, oh, less than an hour's drive from the Serbian border. So we're talking about South Central Hungary. That's the area that I still go back to regularly as a social anthropologist. I have expanded my horizons in the last five years or so, so that I now investigate the market town close to the village and not just the village itself. 
which has fewer than 2,000 people. I will say a little bit more perhaps about that village if there is a time later, but, but it's well known in anthropology that other people's ethnography is rather boring. Um, so I, I will not really present any ethnography today because I don't know you very well. I thought I would begin with some very general remarks about Hungary and others who know more about Hungary than I do will correct me if I get anything seriously wrong. But what I think is relevant for the story that I want to tell is the fact that Hungary is on the periphery of industrialized capitalist Europe, has been on that periphery for many centuries. Since Habsburg, even since Ottoman days, semi-periphery is the category used in, in Wallerstein's uh, classification, the world systems theory that still exists, uh, is still debated in certain places. I think the concept of periphery is still relevant in the very new context that we have today, after four decades of socialism in the era of neoliberalism, if you like. We can debate the relevance of that particular term, but I find it useful as a shorthand. Now, Hungary, a much smaller state following the First World War, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire was taken apart, the core of the Hungarian state lies in the Carpathian Basin, and much of this land is extremely fertile. So it is well endowed from the point of view of growing a great variety of crops. Uh, the endowment in terms of, yes, uh, sunshine and water and the quality of the soils. In my particular area, the soils are not so good, about the worst that you'll find anywhere in Hungary. But other conditions are more favorable. There's a lot of variation. And there is a lot of variation as you cross this relatively small country, whether you go from east to west or from north to south, relatively small, but extremely diverse, not only ecologically, but sociologically. And what I think is of relevance for my story today is simply the late development and the hierarchies of a predominantly agrarian society that lingered well into the 20th century and were not really addressed, were not overcome until the socialist era. That's to say four decades following the end of the Second World War, 1949 is often taken as the starting date uh, for the Communist Party's monopoly of political power in socialist, the People's Republic of Hungary, <coughs> its proper name in that era. In the decades before socialism, many so-called populist writers, that's not quite the same usage of populism that the political scientists debate nowadays, the older populists, those who are nearer to the Narodniki in the Russian tradition. The Hungarian populists documented a gulf between town and countryside, urbanus and nepi. Nepi meaning coming from the word for people, uh, indicating, uh, if you like, the rustic folk, the ordinary peasantry. All of these words uh, have their problems. But peasantry was the word most widely applied by social scientists. The Hungarian peasantry was not integrated into the bourgeois nation because, of course, Capitalism was developing from the later 19th century. There was a, an embryonic bourgeoisie, in, above all in the capital city, Budapest, but also in other towns. So there was an expanding urban, even industrial, above all commercial sector, which was ethnically not so predominantly Magyar, Hungarian, as the countryside, which had very different hierarchies. Semi-feudal is the label used loosely applied to the structure of Hungarian society right down to the 1940s. And I can provide some names uh, of the Hungarian writers, including early sociologists who documented this dual social structure. The two sectors, the gulf between town and countryside was huge. And the villages that I studied were hardly integrated into a nation state until the socialist era. That is a, an encapsulated uh, summary of my work over the decades in Tazla, that an incorporation into the national society 
was accomplished in the decades of collectivization, which in Hungary was pursued in a much more flexible way than any other country in the Soviet bloc, for sure. You can argue about the Yugoslav case, which was, of course, very special in Poland, where I have also done field work in the rural sector, no mass collectivization at all. The village that I studied, which is called Tazlar, epitomized the pragmatic, rational, compromise-seeking strategy adopted in Hungary after the political catastrophe of 1956. So from the early 1960s onwards, instead of forcing the peasantry, still a very large segment of the, of the total population, instead of forcing these villagers into Soviet-style collective farms, the great majority of families in the village I study could carry on farming pretty much as usual on their old plots. Their property rights were undermined, but they were given every possible help by a so-called specialist cooperative to farm their small plots more efficiently, to market their produce through socialist channels, uh, and eventually to accumulate resources. The village did indeed prosper in the 19th 60s, 70s, and although the acceleration declined somewhat in the 1980s, people look back on those socialist decades as an era of property accumulation in the sense of consumer property, new houses, new motor cars, bathrooms were built on isolated farmsteads that had never had piped water before. Uh, incredible material development, unprecedented. But there was also a more general political and cultural incorporation into the nation. Aslar is only 120, 125 kilometers away from Budapest, but that distance was vast in the pre-socialist period. Uh, it, the trains didn't get very much faster, I have to say. I took the slow train from Budapest to the neighboring community when accessing the village. Uh, it's a two and a half hour ride on even the faster train. <laughs> That will change with the Belt and Road Scheme because China is financing an upgrade of that motor of that railway so that it should be possible to travel from Budapest to the village that I have studied very much faster in the not too distant future. But I'm not really talking about kilometers and the time it takes to get from the village to the capital. I'm talking in a more metaphorical way about the distance between town and countryside. I think the Hungarian agrarian strategy under socialism narrowed that gap enormously. And depending on what kind of statistics you look at, it's quite easy to show that average incomes for some sections of the rural population were very much higher than the working class in the cities, nominally the ruling class of the socialist country, but in practice with fewer opportunities to accumulate privately compared to the countryside. So there is a narrowing of the gulf between town and countryside. Now, fast forward into the post-socialist years and all of this changes. Uh, it's rather paradoxical that the political party strongest in the countryside is a survival of the pre-socialist era. The smallholders party insisted that land had to be redistributed if possible in its original boundaries and it wasn't done in quite that fashion in the end, although some other socialist countries did try to fragment socialist farms to give land back within the original boundaries. The Hungarians compromised as usual, but long and the short of it, in the 1990s, after decollectivization, far fewer people were in an opportunity to maintain their households at a, what they considered by now to be a decent standard of living uh, everything fell apart. The socialist synthesis of large-scale farms and households fell apart in the 1990s. It was not adequately replaced by the subsidies that accrued to the new landowners following accession to the European Union in 2004. So the countryside, which had done relatively well under socialism, really disintegrates economically, but also socially and culturally and the political consequences, um, that's, I think, clear to everybody as we look at Viktor Orban's fourth successive victory. Uh, he has a complete monopoly on the Hungarian countryside. His Fidesz party 
which moved decisively to the right in the 1990s, having had some anarchic liberal uh, flirtations in the early 90s when Viktor Orban was, was a young uh, political activist. He's not so young anymore. Uh, he manipulates national symbols and he also has a socioeconomic message. It's a message of security. It's a measure of you won't get it any better than you get it with us. And it is totally convincing to rural voters. So that although I was not visiting Tazla during this election campaign, I am in touch with many friends in the area. And I am absolutely certain, just as they voted for a Fidesz mayor a few years ago, uh, they were solidly behind Viktor Orban in these elections, as were the post peasants, if I may use that term, right across the country. The countryside is the bastion of Viktor Orban's populism. There is a lot more to be said about it, but I don't want to take many more minutes away from Gabor. Just a few words about the theory, which is implicit in our title. I suspect some of you, perhaps all of you, are immediately making a connection to Karl Polanyi when you see the metaphor of embeddedness. He's not actually the very first person to use this metaphor. And he didn't use it all that often himself to be, to be truthful. Um, but in economic anthropology, where I am at home, everybody associates Polanyi with the notion of embeddedness. Uh, Polanyi has become influential in many social sciences, right across the social sciences, I think it's fair to say. He's probably more influential in economic sociology these days than he is in anthropology. And we can go into the reasons for that perhaps in the discussion. But to just explain my thinking, and I'm not sure I can speak for Gabor here, he will correct me promptly if I'm not. But the major message that comes through in Polanyi's Magnum Opus, which is The Great Transformation, published in 1944, this is primarily an analysis of British economic history, and it is an indictment of the free market, the so-called self-regulating market, this utopia, which is in fact a dystopia that Victorian England pursued with the ideals of free trade, laissez-faire, uh, Polanyi traces a direct link between the ideology of laissez-faire. The reality was always a little bit different because Polanyi theorizes a double movement. As you extend the scope for markets, you inevitably, you inevitably give rise to a counter movement for protection for closing down rather than opening up to global markets. And in a nutshell, the theory of Karl Polanyi is as relevant, is judged by many social scientists today to be as relevant to the last four decades of a neoliberal era as it was to the original Victorian era of laissez-faire in the 19th century. Whether or not we can make the connection between populism a la Orban and the connection that Polanyi made between Victorian laissez-faire and the collapse into fascism in the first half of the 20th century, that's perhaps too far-fetched. I try not to make, I'm an anthropologist who works in villages, I am interested in large historical generalizations of that kind. I don't consider Hungary is on an inevitable slide into fascism at the moment, but Hungary does have some disturbing fascist elements in its pre-socialist history, that clearly do play some role in the political landscape in Hungary today. They are probably stronger on balance in the countryside than they are in the cities. All of these statements seem to me to be valid. At the same time, if we are to operationalize Polanyi, we certainly need to dig a little bit deeper. It is not enough to say that since the end of socialism, we have neoliberalism and Orban's populism is a counter movement to this neoliberal market ideology. That is, I think, a part of the picture. But in Gabor's presentation, I suspect, and in his book, which I recommend to you all, in the book called The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, uh, you will see how I think social scientists need to go deeper, break down these very general categories that Polanyi gives us in order to understand what is really going on today and whether the widening gulf between town and countryside that I think we do have again today in Hungary, particularly capital city versus rest of the country. Uh, these are the general elements I draw your attention to. 
And I said I wouldn't go on for more than 15 minutes, so I'll stop and uh, hand over to Gabor at this point. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. should I just take over or? Uh... Yes, please do. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation and for the very kind introduction to, to, to both of you, to Chris also, I think my, my, my book and the, the award in Cambridge. So I have a, um, a presentation that I prepared for today that I'd like to share with you. Um, and uh, as, uh, Chris already reflected on, on it. Um, we gave the title from neoliberal disembedding to neo-nationalist re-embedding in provincial Hungary. Uh, and Chris really gave a, a brilliant overview of, of the big picture and then focusing on, on on what he called the rural uh, dimension of the story. Uh, the, the title has uh, uh, <clears throat> provincial Hungary in it, because uh, if, you, if you really look at the map of Hungary, what you see is basically a divide between the capital or the three biggest cities in the country uh, and, and everything else, including medium and, and like in Hungarian terms, bigger towns throughout Hungary. So both rural and, and urban areas in, in provincial Hungary are solidly uh, uh, Fidesz-supporting uh, Fides uh, regions in the country. And, and within this story, I'm focusing on, on more, more on, the, on the towns, so not the rural areas, uh, but, but on the towns and what I see as the sociopolitical afterlife of the industrialization, which is very much a consequence or part of the neoliberal disembedding story that that Chris was uh, was referring to. So uh, this presentation builds on on on, uh, on my research that I uh, published in in various uh, outlets in various forms. So instead of digging very much uh, into the deep into the empirical details, I, I will concentrate on on the overall narrative. But I also added some uh, figures and some interview quotes uh, to the very end of this uh, presentation in this appendix. So if you have time and if you are interested, I'm, I can go back to the details also uh, from, from this empirical material. So let us, uh, let us start. Um, I think the very first uh, Thing that we have to understand is is that the the political transformation of Hungary uh, hinges on uh, the collapse or has hinged on on the collapse of the left in provincial areas of Hungary and within that there were ruler strongholds uh, that were previous industrial towns in the socialist era. And these industrial towns function, operated in a very similar way, of course, a different social structure as described by, by Chris for rural areas, offering a kind of embedding for industrial citizens in these towns, various welfare services, community life, uh, and a very strong sense of, of working class identity as basically the big winners of, of socialism. I'm oversimplifying the story, but, but, but this, is, this is the starting point uh, of industrial towns in, in socialist Hungary. And the left, which is basically equal to the socialist party in, in Hungary, and, and here the left really denotes more a kind of a political position, uh, which is the socialist party in Hungary, and the right is then Fidesz. It's, really questionable whether this, this translates into left and right wing ideology in terms of economic and social policy, but let's bracket this for, for a moment and use left as just simply denoting political positions. So, so really the rural strongholds of the left were, were rural towns, uh, provincial industrial towns in, in Hungary that they kind of inherited, uh, they inherited this working class culture and the, all the networks that are associated with from, from the socialist era. And the left did not invest into maintaining that kind of culture, that kind of milieu, developing a kind of narrative that resonates with people's experience in this uh, part, of, uh, part of Hungary. And what this resulted in is this. 
So this is 2018. Orange is the political chiral of Fidesz. And as you can see, you have uh, the capital Budapest and you have uh, uh, basically three towns outside Budapest or three uh, regional constituencies where the opposition was successful. And this is how it looks like uh, now, 2022. Again, you have the two big cities in Southern Hungary, Pécs and Szeged, and you have Budapest. So the opposition is really a kind of a cosmopolitan, high urban or metropolitan phenomenon in Hungary. And then you have provincial Hungary with all its villages, uh, small and medium sized towns, uh, including also many, many towns with, with around 100,000 population. So these are, in Hungarian terms, relatively big towns. Um, so I th understanding how, how Fidesz managed to shift th this part of the country is, I think, crucial. And uh, there are two main narratives that I, I think are slightly misleading, uh, but you can encounter them very, very frequently. One is about political rogues, but this is in general, you know, if you look at the populism literature, perhaps this is the most prominent explanation. Uh, analysts like to look at political agency and analyze the movements, maneuvers of, of politicians. In the case of Hungary, it's of course, Viktor Orban. Uh, and in this narrative, there, there are no structural reasons for illiberalism, all that things that Chris was talking about, neoliberal disembedding and, and the story of, of uh, of uh, the, the country's economic integration is just not there because it's all about Viktor Orban. And the implication is if we get rid of the bad guy, then things will go back to the normal as they were before 2010. Uh, but I think this is, this is very misleading and one of the reasons why key figures of the liberal opposition in Hungary who are concentrating solely on Viktor Orban, believing that before 2010 everything was okay, is just this is not something that resonates with the lived experience of people outside the capital area. And there is another uh, big narrative about the dysfunctional working class culture. Again, this is not something just about Hungary. If you look at, for example, the US, you get the same. You have uh, liberal intellectuals blaming, uh, blaming provincial working classes. In this case, like, you know, like Hillary Clinton's famous uh, term the basket of deplorables. You have the Hungarian versions of this, uh, which is uh, elites blaming uh, rural populations, provincial populations, including workers for their lack of education and, and basically their dysfunctional culture. Uh, and as part of this argument is that among these people, these are just basically genetically anti-liberal and nationalist and anti-democratic, and there's no demand for left-wing politics. And this goes so far that my good friend uh, and, and the mayor of Budapest, and until now, uh, the co-chair of the party that I'm still a member of, which is a self-defined green left political party in Hungary, uh, when he stepped down as the, the one of the nominees competing in the uh, primary elections in, in, in Hungary, he said, he, he's doing so because there is no demand for left-wing politics in Hungary. So this is, this is very, very prevalent in, in the country and, and explains, ex, explains a, a lot about the, the weakness of, of progressive oppositional culture. And of course, the strategic uh, conclusion from this is that to forge a successful political strategy, you need to exclude these anti-liberal liberal workers from, from progressive social coalitions and you end up with this metropolitan liberal progress political identity that the uh, opposition was offering again in 2022 uh, in, in the country. It's very important to see that this is not just a Hungarian phenomenon. I think this is one of the most important dividing lines today in, in, in politics all, all over the globe. It's playing out differently in, in various countries. Uh, in Hungary, it has also its, its specificities, but this is a very global phenomenon. And uh, I'm trying to offer uh, a, a different narrative. And it, turn, it has turned out that, that our narrative is, is very, very aligned uh, with, with, with Chris and our research points in very similar directions. So um, uh, we, we co-edited this special issue for, for Europe Asia studies on neoliberal capitalism and the Visegrad counter movements, which is perhaps the 
the best entry point if you want to understand Hungary, but also the countries in, in the region and, and the story that we are talking about. And I collected some of the other uh, studies that, that I published on, 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 on the topic. If you are interested more in the details, I am very, very happy to, to send, these, uh, send these to you. And uh, to summarize these contributions, uh, what I try to do in my research is to shift the focus to the mismanaged dependent development so the, as Chris was very well referring to the semi-peripheral integration of the country into the global economy and how the neoliberal disembedding uh, resulting from this international integration uh, led to a neo-nationalist uh, re-embedding. And I think this, this phrase of disembedding and re-embedding is crucial. And as part of the story, I also like to use integration and disintegration, which are again, very, very important to, to understand, uh, understand Hungary. As the country integrates globally, there's a process of social, economic, but also cultural disintegration. And basically, Fidesz is the only political power that really understands and responds to this process and offers symbolic reintegration to, to many people in the country. And instead of uh, focusing on the roots of working class nationalism, uh, in, in, in the cultural le legacy of, of civilization and incompetence, what I try to do is to show how the industrialization fueled the nationalist resentment among workers on the one hand, but I also show the role of the national bourgeoisie paraphernalized by transnational investors, um, which is a very important story again, especially in provincial Hungary. Um, and this leads to, this led to, uh, so I identify an illiberal cross-class alliance or social coalition forged by Victor Orman among the political class, members of the political class, national business class, including small and medium-sized enterprises that are very important to dominate provincial Hungary, uh, transnational capital, especially industrial export capital. So Orban is not some kind of anti-neoliberal maverick. He's very much embedded in the global neoliberal capitalist economy. But he's also able to pacify disgruntled workers and relative victims of, of the regime and underclasses through material benefits, but also through symbolic uh, uh, politics. And I hope I will have some time to get back to these strategies at the very end of the presentation. And I give all kinds of uh, statistics in, in, in my book and, and, uh, and the other papers about the process of social and economic disintegration throughout the 90s that Chris was also referring to. Here, I would like to highlight the role of the industrialization, which there is a huge discourse on this in, in the US and many Western economies. Uh, but this has not really been uh, uh, properly understood by Hungarian intellectuals. And, and I think in, in Eastern Europe, the focus is more on reindustrialization through foreign investment. But the experience in the 90s was really a massive deindustrialization. So what this shows is that uh, almost like there was more than 40% of manufacturing employment loss in Hungary between 86 and, and 95, way exceeding the decline in, in total employment. So there is a massive destruction of industrial capacities. To compare uh, the US, uh, the most the industrialist towns in the 70s and 80s, such as New York or Philadelphia and others, experienced a 30% decline in manufacturing. The UK in the 80s, 25%. But Hungary, over basically a little bit more than five years, almost every second person employed in manufacturing lost their job. Now, this is a massive social shock, which basically has left a black hole in the social fabric of society. And this has not been properly analyzed and understood uh, and has long-term implications. And there are very many ways to which you can unpack the social and political and economic implications. And just to save time, I decided to focus on, on health and mortality because I think the way the lived experience of the industrialization gets embodied is perhaps one of the most powerful ways to capture its, its negative consequences. So uh, as these economic shocks engulfed Eastern Europe, more than 7 million people died prematurely in the region in the 90s. The most of them died in Russia as a result of shock therapy, including the industrialization. But also several thousands of people died prematurely in Hungary. And compared to the Visegrad countries, 
there was a massive drop in, in, in life expectancy in the 90s. And one of the legs of my research shows that the industrialization in provincial towns in Hungary is among the chief primary upstream political and economic causes of this excess wave of mortality in, in, in Hungary. So what this shows between 89 and 95, there is a strong correlation between the extent of the industrialization and, 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 and male mortality in, in, in medium-sized provincial towns, ex-industrial towns in Hungary, the same type of towns that I'm ref I was referring to previously that were mostly the rural strongholds or provincial strongholds of, of the left. Uh, but this is not just about the first part of the 90s. It has long-term consequences. By the 2000s, life expectancy has been increasing or was increasing in the country. Uh, but still, the extent of the industrialization in the 90s uh, is correlated with higher death rates in the 2000s. So what this means is that you have a growing inequality as life expectancy grows, the towns that were deindustrialized in the 90s uh, are suffering the long-term disadvantages so that the cascading effects of the industrialization. And this leads to all kinds of physical and mental suffering. You could unpack the material aspects, you could unemployment loss, but I think this captures something quite profound and powerful. Um, the industrialization is not the only thing. And if you look at privatization, for example, in Hungary, associated also with the closure of plants, you can see a very similar process while the industrialization hurt primarily men in the first part of the 90s, uh, I collected data on companies, again, medium-sized provincial towns in Hungary. These are the same 52 towns that you can see here. Um, and what I found is that uh, in the same 52 towns, in towns that were dominated by private ownership, so basically privatized, like the chances of dying for women in the, between 95 and 2004 was significantly higher. And the reason is that because in state-owned companies, um, such as in clothing and many other light manufacturing industries, uh, by that time, so in the early 2000s, women were overrepresented. But when state companies were privatized, women withdrew, lost their jobs, and this led to all kinds of social disintegrative processes, including increased mortality among women over the long run. So it's not just men, women were also affected by this, by this uh, economic transformation. Um, and to understand really the details, I, with the help of assistance, we conducted 82 interviews in four of these towns from these 52 towns, these medium-sized towns that I analyzed quantitatively. And, uh, this is more than 2,000 pages of interview material, so it's impossible to summarize it uh, briefly. Um, so I just wanted to show you these uh, silly word clouds, uh, which doesn't show that much in this case, but it shows you one thing, namely that workers readily connect their experience on the labor market, the economic shocks, privatization, jobs, uh, with humiliation, so mental, mental suffering and dysfunctional coping strategies such as drinking and their health. These are intertwined in the way people talk about their experience when it comes to, comes to health. Um, and researchers have to understand these, these complex mechanisms. And, and this is one of the things that I'm trying to do in my research. Uh, another way to look at the interview material and analyze it is, is to see how this lived experience uh, of, of these economic shocks has led to a transformation of people's identity. And I, as I was referring to it previously, uh, a crucial part of the story is that as people experience this new post-socialist capitalism and, 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 and sort of the, the misery and exploitation, all the things that you can see in this graph, uh, you would think that this is a fertile ground for left-wing mobilization, but in fact, the left is neglecting these areas, has been neglecting for, for three decades by now, and concentrating on the experience of the upper echelons of the biggest cities, which is basically intellectuals. And they are defining the narrative of the left or have been defining until very recently in the country, which is totally in disconnect 
the lived experience of people in these medium-sized towns. Uh, so there is no working class identity. There is no community anymore that was there in the 80s. And people talk about individual suffering, but when they shift to who is the V, it's not the working class or it's, it's you know, or any kind of more progressive identity. Who is suffering when it comes to V? V, Hungarians. V, the nation is suffering. And then this leads to a kind of reimagination of solidarity through the language of the nation. The nation is about material protection, protecting ourselves against the vicissitudes of the global market, the global economy, and those nasty liberal elites that have brought all this suffering upon us. And this is what Viktor Orban is able to exploit in these areas of the, of the country, offering a symbolic reintegration of these people through the language of, of the nation, which is very much a material imagined community of, of solidarity. This has played out, of course, electorally. Uh, so what you can see on this graph is that the left has completely lost its embeddedness in the working classes in Hungary. So whereas in the early 2000s, what the odd for index shows is that when it's positive, then uh, the given party is overrepresented in the working class. And the left here in blue was slightly overrepresented in 2002 and 2004 in the working classes. This was the time of the uh, of of uh, of Peter Medjesi's, uh welfare-oriented uh, left social democratic politics, uh, but this was the last time that the left had a majority of of the working classes supporting them, and this support totally collapsed uh, by the second part of the 2000s, and Fidesz emerged basically as one of the key representatives of, of workers and to a lesser degree, the radical right Jobbik party. And the left has not been able to reclaim its, its basically historical claim over representing the working classes. So this is, this is one important story. And just highlighting that workers or underclasses are not the only part. Another focus point of my research is, is businesses. Businesses are very often described as, as big victims of populism, globally, but in Hungary as well. So the narrative is that you have oh, the, the few corrupt oligarchs, you know, the mafia state, Viktor Orban's friends and family and everything, everyone else who's doing business is losing out. But this is a, I mean, this is a misunderstanding. Viktor Orban has very cleverly made alliance with all kinds of different parts of the economic elite in Hungary, uh, what this graph shows is, is here in the center, in the left, you have political capitalists. So these are the corrupt oligarchs, but there are other types of capitalists that I identify in my research uh, that are supporting Viktor Orban. And among them, the most important group is what I call emerging capitalists. So these have been mostly small and medium-sized entrepreneurs who <laughs> were facing really difficult times in growing their businesses because they lacked access to funding, but also because they lacked access to, to the most lucrative segments of the economy that were dominated by transnational corporations. So what Viktor Orban did is they basically re they, he, he integrated this part of society, the economic elites, small and medium-sized enterprises, but also the national capitalist class to the ruling bloc in Hungary, basically renegotiating the terms of the deal that was forged with transnational capitalists in the early 90s. Uh, but Orban did not kick out uh, German car manufacturing companies or anything like that. He just invited basically the national capitalists and small and medium-sized enterprises to, uh, to, to cold rule, so to speak, the country. And this is very important because once you have the alliance of businesses, large businesses, uh, but also medium-sized businesses, you, you, you have a dominant position throughout the, throughout the countryside, throughout provincial Hungary. And if you add state institutions, these businesses, you add the nationalist reintegration of, of workers, and you can see what a powerful social coalition Viktor Orban has throughout the country, vertically and, and, and geographically. Uh, but behind this, there's also a more kind of institutional story. And, and this is something that perhaps you, you are more familiar with. 
because this is what you can read a lot about in, in newspapers about basically the lack of democracy and authoritarianism. And perhaps Chris does not like this narrative that much. And I, I see the point why, why, why not, because when you focus on this, you distract the tension away from all that, that, what ca that came before. And that's very true because these things are most often used to, to, you know, to belittle neoliberal disembedding. But still, these are still important and make the life of the opposition very, very hard in, in, in Hungary. So if you look at just one month before uh, the election in, in March in, in, in 2022, Fidesz was, was able to spend more than eight times more on, on billboards than the opposition. Uh, so this is how the March political outdoor ad spending looked like in Hungary. Orange is again Fidesz, and this green little thing right next to it is the opposition. This is how billboards look like in March in the country. And, and one of the reasons is, is that Fidesz has much more money than the opposition to begin with, but it's also using government communication to, to, to convey the same political message. There's no boundary between Fidesz propaganda and governmental communication. And there are these quasi NGOs uh, that uh, the Fidesz funded and uses state funds to, to finance that are also uh, advertising politically. So that's just one aspect of the institutional inequalities. Every government controlled institution works as part of the Fidesz political machinery. Uh, police and the general attorney do not check Fidesz, but persecute the opposition. And you pick any one of the major leaders in, in, in the opposition, there was an effort to try to use the police or, uh, or some kind of politically directed attack against them. On the other hand, the opposition controlled towns under political are uh, under politically inflicted financial strains. So Budapest, for example, is on the verge of financial bankruptcy. Whenever they try to do something, they are facing this, this central budget uh, limit imposed by Viktor Orban, who's trying to punish opposition-led uh, government, local governments. And there is a complete hegemony in provincial media and public broadcasting. Now, this is not to say that these people are duped uh, simply by this uh, uh, broadcasting machinery. But what it says is that it's it's more difficult for the opposition to organize if there is any there were any discontent. Sixth, there is this tactical trap of the divided opposition and the new first past the post electoral system. So the opposition needs to cooperate because local constituencies play a dominant role in the Hungarian parliament. So if you want to win seats, you have to win the local uh, uh, local districts. And it's just the one round, single round, whoever gets the majority wins, uh, wins the round. Uh, so this, this forces a kind of cooperation upon the opposition, but the opposition is very divided. You have the old school socialists, you have the old neoliberals, you have new liberals, you have new left, you have new greens, and they are very, very different in terms of outlook. Now, uh, under a normal proportional representation, like let's say in Germany, these parties don't have to cooperate. But in a system like in the UK, uh, you have two competing blocks. And this is forcing something on Hungary, on the Hungarian opposition that is very close to prisoner's dilemma. Every actor is interested rationally not to cooperate. They want to maximize their own shares. They want, want to maximize their own seats. So what you end up is, is a divided opposition forging a coalition at the last moment. But by the time they get there, they don't have any time left really to build up a new narrative. Even if they were to understand what is going on in provincial Hungary, they would have a few months to build up a compelling identity. And it's just very, very difficult. And this finally, represents a massive disintensive, massive disintensive for high caliber personalities to enter politics, which creates a credibility crisis uh, politically in, in, in Hungary. So uh, I'm approaching 30 minutes, sorry if I'm speaking too long. To conclude briefly, Fidesz's hegemony is rooted in its political response to neoliberal disembanding that resulted from Hungary's semi-peripheral peripheral dependent integration into the European and global economy and uses a neo-nationalist, or you are using the term authoritarian populist, I think they are close to each other, re-embedding strategy as a political response to, to neoliberal disembedding. And Orban was able to forge a winning social coalition dominating provincial Hungary 
by emancipating or integrating national business unit in SMEs into the dominant power structure. Also doubling down on industrial export by foreign investors. So if you look at the labor code, it has become even more neoliberal than it was before and trade unions are having a, an even more, an even harder time than, than before. And this is very good for industrial export capital and German car manufacturing co companies. But at the same time, Orban is also able to pacify the relative victims, the workers and other classes, A, because they got material benefits, um, because the economy was booming under Viktor Orban, uh, but also Viktor Orban has redistributed some money to these people, but also through symbolic reintegration, through neo-nationalism and other political populist messages that are directed to these people who felt neglected and alienated by the liberal elites during the time of the neoliberal disembedding. And finally, again, there's this institutional component of, of authoritarianism or liberalism in Hungary that makes it makes the opposition's life even more, more, more difficult and, and challenging. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I'm very happy to, to send any, any of these studies to you and answer any of the questions. And I have this appendix here. Um, with a lot of graphs and quotes, so if you if you are interested in some of the details, I'm very happy to share them. Thank you very much, Chris and Gabor. This was really good. We're not going to applaud too loudly because it's going to not be too nice um, sound-wise. But uh, we're very happy about that. And uh, yeah, we have of course the biggest question. So where will you know change? come from from that but i'm going to let my colleagues to ask uh, other ones too because this is maybe a too big one for for the start so go ahead and uh, it would be great if uh, you could also like very quickly introduce yourself what is your you know your name and and your topic of interest and, and i keep track on the people online yeah you can keep thank you Clark. also so uh, yes sure can i kick off i'm um, sorry adam Payne. I know nothing about Hungary, so I come from a position of complete ignorance, but I was really struck by the parallel scabble between your arguments about the deindustrialization effects and Anne Case and Angus Deaton's arguments about excess deaths. Uh, I, I wanted to push you a little more, is to, in a sense, how distinctive is, in a sense, the deindustrialization process in Hungary in comparison with what's um, what, in a sense, Angus Deaton and Anne Case have argued for in the case of the US. In a sense, is it distinctively different or is it simply more of the same phenomenon? Should I answer or should we collect more questions or...? Um, I, I think we can collect one more at least. And uh, yeah, um, I, I have Patrick. Patrick. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Patrick Oscar, so I, I work in the department. My, my so throat is a bit sore today. Um, I also have very little knowledge of Hungary, but I, I'm really struck by this really neat theoretical, empirical connectedness that you're, you're showing that there's so much more than rural populism here. I mean, among all of, of, of the impressive publications, I, you know, is there a methods paper for confused urban intellectuals like me to understand the countryside in most parts of the world, because I work mainly on India, but I, I see how one could think of Sweden and other places in this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Patrick. So I think, yeah, Gabor, if you could answer these two. And Chris, jump in. Uh, I'm not sure I, I fully understood the second question. So uh, could you, could you brief? Raise that, please, Patrick. I, I just find that, you know, let's say uh, one works on India and it's, oh, it's a Hindu nationalism that's taking over the message. It's the control over the broadcasting apparatus and very much similar, uh, you know, you, you have that list at the end, but how would one understand the empirical reality of, of, of a nation? And, and, and do you have sort of a, a, an approach to understanding uh, rural workers, rural countryside people beyond rhetorics of populism, authoritarianism, 
uh, mixed in various countries with religious uh, ethno-nationalist sentiments. I mean, how do you look beyond that facade? Do you have a, a sort of... Okay, got it. Um, so, uh, th thank you. Uh, so, uh, perhaps if we have time uh, to get back to the question where real change comes from, because this, this always comes up and uh, this is the most difficult and most political question that you know this in this topic so maybe let's leave it to the end and uh, if i understood your name correctly adam uh, you were uh, referring to the parallels with case and eaton and deindustrialization in in the us and yeah that's uh, that's not a coincidence um i think there are a lot of parallels and and in fact uh i was just co-author of, of a of a study that came out in the annual review of sociology with the title deaths of despair in comparative perspective and what we do there is we show the similarities of, of the deaths of despair epidemic in the US, primarily driven by economic shocks such as the industrialization and the post socialist mortality crisis in countries such as Russia or Hungary and, and some other Eastern European countries. And of course, there are differences. Like in the US, you have this special drug environment, powerful pharmaceutical companies pushing. Uh, opioid painkillers uh, that contributed to, to the deaths of this epidemic. And you don't have that kind of liberal pharmaceutical environment in, in, in Europe. Uh, but the what created the demand for, you know, for stress relievers uh, or, or strong antidepressants or any like mind altering substances such as drugs or alcohol was the experience, the lived experience of economic shocks and the industrialization. And that's really similar in the US, in Eastern Europe, Hungary, uh, but also you have uh, this in, in, in many parts of, of the UK also. Um, and uh, I think I, I would like to emphasize really the, the, the similarities, not because uh, they are completely the same phenomenon. Of course, every country has its own history. Uh, but because uh, there is a tendency to say that, oh, that's of despair in the US. Yes, it's horrible, but US is such a peculiar country. Oh, the post socialist austerity crisis. Yeah, that was horrible, but this is, you know, socialism. So it's, it's just the afterlife of socialism and, and stupid working class people drinking too much. And, and uh, this is not something that normally happens uh, under well functioning capitalism, such as we do have in, in other parts of the world. But if you put the two together, then you see that this is not really about uh, only about uh, pharmaceutical companies or only about working class, dysfunctional working class. And this is not just about socialism. But socialism is so much more about capitalism than it was about socialism, right? So these are really the ways in which neoliberal capitalism hurts people physically and and, and emotionally and, and mentally. And I think it's very very important to get the get the get the parallels. So I would say it's it's more something more of the same. Of course, the transformation was much more severe in Eastern Europe. You you had, you had many more things happening in parallel. Um, and, and it led to a sort of a scale, like you don't have 7 million excess deaths uh, in, in the US so far, uh, thank God. Uh, so, so the scale of the two epidemics is, 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 is very different. Uh, in the Eastern Europe, it was more alcohol that people use to relieve stress. In the US, it's, it's the availability of, of opiate drugs that is dominant. But they also, the, the, the deaths are due to uh, uh, drinking, such as uh, you know, liver disease, is is increasing significantly. Suicides is also are also increasing significantly. So this all shows the role of of of, of stress. And the second question, I think uh, maybe Chris wants to uh, answer that also, uh, uh, because I think like anthropologists have played such a such an important role in really identifying the lived experience of these economic shocks early on, and. Uh, you know, I'm primarily a sociologist and political economist, but I really like to read economic anthropologists and, and political anthropologists because they they were the first ones to warn uh, warn us about uh, how these things might go uh, awry in, in 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 Eastern Europe. And there are different schools, uh, but uh, 
Chris has contributed a lot to understanding the process of this Polanyan disembedding. Uh, he also cooperated a lot with uh, um, Don Cobb, and uh, Don was the editor of, of a book called, uh, uh, now I, I, I forgot the exact title, but it's about the uh, headlines of nation and subtext of class, I think. Uh, so it's, it's using ethnographic material to show how, how nationalism is really about transformation of crash relations and the lived experience of these economic transformations. So in my own research, I'm, I'm, which I'm publishing mostly in sociology journals, I'm really using these social anthropological ideas of disintegration the, 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 and, and the research on, on relational class, which is very much rooted in, 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 in social anthropology. And I think that's, that's, that's important because this is a very powerful way to connect the lived experience, the macro, macro processes. I don't know if you want to, to add to this, 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 Chris. Well, let me come in briefly because, uh, Gabo, I think you've said the essentials. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation to be more comparative. And data, the North American material is fascinating. I come from industrialized, nowadays deindustrializing South Wales. And I can see it in my hometown, my home constituency, how uh, industrial ex-workers in South Wales vote for Brexit. It cannot be in their material interests, but somehow a prime minister who is an old Etonian uh, is able to play these symbolic games and convince them that they are really British and the British lion will roar again. Sorry, but um, there are serious analyses of that red wall of how the same populist forces, populist in quotation marks, I'm personally more uncomfortable with that word than I am with neoliberal. What makes Hungary interesting, it is at that intersection between the general neoliberal trends, the more specific post-socialist conjuncture, and the fact that within the post-socialist countries, the Hungarian provincial adaptations were remarkably successful. In other words, the collapse after 1990 was experienced more severely by ordinary Hungarians than any of their neighboring uh, neighbors in what was then Czechoslovakia, Poland. They're all different cases, but the Hungarian, uh, the sharpness of the, the Orban phenomenon has a lot to do with these three factors. It's neoliberal, it's post-socialist, and it's a consequence of that rather successful, flexible Hungarian collectivization as documented by Nigel Swain, Susanna Varga, and there's lots of good literature on that in English. The only other point I'd throw in, Gabor, in response to your comments, uh, you are quite right to draw attention to those uh, very obvious factors that the liberal journalists in Budapest comment on, the billboards, the domination of the media by the government, all of those things are true, and I, I would not question any of that. What I think we might stress a little more, from the point of view of creating a politics of the left, um, I wonder if our audience in Sweden uh, is aware of the, the pretty blatant uh, neoliberal credentials of the opposition candidate. The Socialist Party was theoretically uniting behind somebody who, who was explicitly identifying with the right and with a pro-market right wing. So in that context, is it surprising that ordinary people in both towns and cities uh, and the villages, of course, are attracted by a populist prime minister who is offering material benefits. You didn't give the examples, but the most widely commented upon, uh, in my experience, it's the reduction of utility bills, which the Orban government makes um, a gesture against neoliberalism, when the opposition is actually saying, we want more neoliberalism. And that links to a question by Ricardo Bomarco in chat, which I have just read, I've been pondering that because, of course, I have friends in the capital city who used to belong to the Free Democrats before that party collapsed. And they often ask me what they ask me, a foreigner, to explain what is going on in the countryside of their own country. And I say, well, why don't you sometimes go there and find out? The truth is that in the 1990s and the 2000s and down to the present day, Viktor Orban makes quite sure that leading figures in his party go out to the smaller towns and villages even, and they have meetings and they network. But the leaders, the intellectuals, who were the dissidents from the 1970s onwards, who led 
they were very active in parliament for two decades and Gabor knows the individuals that I'm talking about here who I have in mind. They were not willing to get their hands dirty and go to places like Kishkun Halash to do politics on the ground. So when they complain about the populism of Orban, I say to these, my friends in the big city, they have only themselves to blame for not respecting basic norms of democratic politics. If it's no longer as liberal as they would like it to be, they say, we should have been more liberal in the 1990s than we really were. And I say to them, it's liberalism and neoliberalism and your own academic uh, arrogance towards the rest of the population that is responsible <coughs> for where the intellectuals have got to in Hungary today. It's a pretty bitter indictment, and I get into trouble with my friends for saying this, but they have only themselves to blame. So, so the last part uh, was uh, of, of Chris's response was the response to a response in the chat that people in the room cannot read. So Ricardo wrote, could you repeat what the intellectuals did or did wrong while Orban et al. successfully exploited the discontent amongst workers and rural communities? And that's what uh, Chris responded to very clearly now, I think, also. We have two people in online. First Brian and then Jens. Thank you, and thank you for a very interesting presentation. First, I have a, a, a quick comment uh, that, you know, so I, I do research in Ukraine and I was, I was listening to this presentation to try to find the similarities with Ukraine. And then in line with Adam's question, I was struck by how, you know, how, how this is so similar to, to the United States. Um, and Gabor, you, you said that you would get to a, you know, sort of the question about what is to be done. And so I just wanted to, I mean, I remember uh, I happened, I, I was in the US shortly after in Tennessee, where I'm from, shortly after Hillary made her deplorable, Hillary Clinton made her deplorable comment. And I remember thinking, looking around that, mm, and maybe I'm an arrogant elite thinking, mm, some of these people are deplorable. But I also remember thinking, ooh, she should not have said that. Um, and um, so, I, so I just, I wonder at some point, and maybe, you know, other people have similar sorts of questions. I just wonder, what can we do? I mean, your presentation makes it sound like this is the way it's going to be for quite some time, that this is entrenched. Um, and then another question is that so we talk about, um, you know, that, you know, the Hungarian experience now, you know, we talk about how it's very similar to, uh, uh, Chris Hahn talked about you know Wales, uh, and we talked about the U.S. Uh, and uh, and Chris said that you you have this um, this you know neoliberalism following sort of the communist period plus this post-socialist conjuncture plus neoliberalism. And I wondered if there's any way in which we can also talk about um, a convergence in sort of the socialist experience and I guess the capitalist experience between East and West. I mean, obviously collectivization is something that's very different. Um, uh, you know, the way farming was organized and whatnot uh, in, in Eastern Europe. But I wonder if there's in any sense, particularly we're talking about, you know, industry and working class and anything like that, if that, if that is, can help us understand uh, what's happening today. So. Should we take Jens also before you respond? Yes. Thank you. Jens, Jens Ergon, CCL, Uppsala University. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for a very interesting presentation. Um, and, and first a note uh, uh, regarding different national contexts. Uh, me, myself, I reflect on the Swedish context. I mean, uh, <laughs> very different, but uh, I mean, Sweden was once regarded as the, the role model of the Scandinavian wealth. I mean, the, the Scandinavian welfare model, Sweden was regarded as the role model of that. But, um, as we all know, during the past uh, three decades or so, uh, Sweden has shown the shar sharpest increase in inequality in the whole OECD region, and, and we have, has, have had our own surge in 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 in, um, uh, in the form of the Sweden Democrats and so on. I mean, they are not in majority, but they influence the political agenda heavily, and we we, we have our own. Um, uh, Development, which where you can draw draw parallels, perhaps. Uh, I, I, then to my question, I myself I, I tried to work on a, 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 a how to use Polanyi uh, 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 Polanyian framework to understand the development of the past decades, 
of, 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 of neoliberal globalization and its current backlash to understand conditions for green transformation. And, and I, I, I would like to reconnect to Polanyi and ask Gabor, how, 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 do, you, how do you view the usefulness of, 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 of Polanyi's framework and how, how, how could it be updated and changed to understand this kind of development in different national contexts today? Thanks. Uh, we have Katarina as well. Should we take Katarina's question as well before you respond? Yeah, yes, sure. And, and then we have no one on the list. So, my, thank you both for a very nice, uh, interesting presentation. My name is Katarina. I'm a PhD candidate here in rural development. Um, with the risk of, of amplifying maybe a very tiny issue that Gabor uh, brought attention to, was also perhaps signaled in the use of the word hegemony and the talk about how uh, th th this is kind of he hegemony and we have to be, um, we talk about why do people want these things. I was just thinking, is there, um, and also in relation to the fact that there is no, as, as if I understand you correctly, there really is not a very good alternative for these people if they want any kind of material improvement. They don't have very much other, many other options to vote for. Is there a risk you think, think do you see a risk when we describe what is going on? Um, like, why would we want to emphasize that this is a hegemonic order when, when what is behind it is also another kind of hegemonic order? Why is it interesting? We could also really describe it as a critique, like emphasize the critique on neoliberal of a, a broken system rather than saying that people are, are not emphasizing, I'm not saying you're emphasizing it, but like drawing attention to the fact that perhaps this is a hegemonic order, there, there is no possibility to gain other information, this is a completely closed system, you, you have to think within it. Um, it was just a reflection and, and I would like to, maybe you could expand on how you think about the, the chosen word in this context about hegemony and, and consciousness and so on. So, your, uh, uh, Chris and, and Gabor, you can choose who wants to begin responding. Do you want to begin now, Chris? No. <laughs> okay, so uh, Brian, uh, you repeated the question of what can we do, and this uh, sort of resonates with Catalina's question uh, uh, about. Uh, whether this is a closed system, a closed and trench hegemony, or or not. So let's 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 try to uh, look at this uh, question. Uh, so up uh, first. So I I think Hungary has reached a point um, where it's really a kind of avant-garde case of of this neo-nationalist authoritarian trend that you see globally. So Hungary is quite far ahead. Uh, and uh, I don't think that there is an easy fix to it within the country, but this doesn't mean that this is sort of inevitable in any way, or that there isn't anything that you could do in Hungary itself. Um, so while I see this regime as quite stable and very well embedded socially, and institutionally also very strong and also internationally very well embedded thanks to German, Austrian and other European uh, financial interests behind it. Uh, I think the opposition has to prepare for, for potential openings. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's the opposition itself that will topple this, this regime. We'll really have to have some kind of uh, major economic or some other uh, external shock that would disturb this uh, um, this system that has really consolidated by now in Hungary. You, you have a, a, a very delicate uh, balance by now, and uh, I don't think that the opposition has the resources to to to, to it in itself to. To, to change it within Hungary. So I'm rather pessimistic and, and the recent supermajority has just reinforced my, my pessimism. But uh, what the opposition needs to learn from this is not just the Hungarian, but, but globally is, is that I think 
neglecting the lived experience of these provincial people, uh, it, you will have to pay a massive price if you do that. And I think you can observe very similar trends in, in, in other countries. I mean, the Democrats have to pay a huge price for, for neglecting workers in the US. And in general, European social Democrats have withdrawn from their historical embeddedness in working class constituencies. And you have a mushrooming of uh, right wing populist parties, in part uh, remobilizing uh, the very same working class uh, constituencies that were previously ne neglected. And uh, the dominant political narrative today, not just in Hungary, but, but in general, is centrist liberalism that is protecting the trembling status quo of, global, of the global li liberal order including its economic and cultural pillars and the national populist push against changing that liberal status quo. And the left doesn't have much to say in this, I, 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 I'm sad to say, with the exception of a few, few countries. So I think the left really needs to refound its social uh, basis. In Hungary, you are facing a hegemonic illiberal regime, so you will really have to plan ahead 10 years or maybe even more, uh, maybe there will be some kind of major crisis globally that, that would help. Uh, but I think it's really 10 or 20 years that we are talking about uh, realistically in Hungary. And you would have to have a new narrative, new identity. Uh, the only identity that the opposition or the liberals in Hungary or progressives, let's use this word, progressives in Hungary had convincingly over the last 30 years was that global political and economic integration will modernize the country and will solve the problems. So our task is as the liberal elites to educate Hungarians to become good liberal and capitalist citizens that can integrate into the global liberal order. And this is the identity of the opposition until the, the dominant identity of key figures within the opposition. Mark Izar, as the right-wing candidate of this left-wing coalition, was epitomizing this. But you also have the key dominant figures associated with the Democratic Coalition or the small new liberal party called Momentum. They represent the same narrative. Uh, and although there is a crack now and social democratic or democratic socialist ideas are re-emerging, they are still on the fringes. So you, first, you need to, to be able to reimagine the progressive, what, what it means to be progressive in, in, in this, this situation. And then second, you need to do the organizing, as Chris was referring to. Uh, one of the pitfalls of neoliberalism was that it was so much focusing on media. Tony Blair was this media celebrity. Victor, uh, George Chine, Ferenc George Chine, the big Hungarian Tony Blair. Uh, his, his big friend in Hungary was also a media celebrity. He didn't care about organizing locally. And this is in general true for social democrats who thought that they inherited their networks from socialist times. That's transformed this to, to the West. They inherited the trade union networks from old times and they can do whatever they want because you have these red walls and those constituencies will vote left whatever happens. But this is gone. You need to organize, you need to go there, you need to understand, you need to be present, otherwise you will lose these, these constituencies. And then third, a special Hungarian tricky situation is that you have to find a, a tactical solution to, to the political cooperation prisoner dilemma game. And the opposition came up with the idea of the uh, of uniting by this primary electoral system, uh, which is, I think, a very good political innovation the most important political innovation that the opposition was able to come up with in the last 12 years. But uh, it didn't work as well as it should have. Uh, by the time the opposition really united behind this very peculiar right-wing uh, uh, prime ministerial candidate, it was already very late. And I think there needs to be a better solution uh, to, to this dilemma of, of political cooperation and then using that political cooperation come up with a clever strategy of 
finding an answer to the resource and institutional inequalities that, that characterize Hungary. And if you take these all together, the organization, the narrative identity, and, and the institutional difficulties, you, you get why I think it's more the 20 than the two years that we're talking about Hungary. But there is a lesson for progressives in other countries. If you don't want to get to where Hungary is, then you really need to rethink what it means to be a, a progressive. And there is great research also in Sweden about labor market insecurity and the support for Sweden Democrats, like quasi-experimental, natural experimental research showing explicitly causal econometric relationship between uh, labor market stress and insecurity and support for the Sweden Democrats. It's there in Sweden, it's there in Italy, it's there in the UK, it's there in France, it's there in Germany. This is vast empirical evidence. We just need to draw the political conclusions. I have really nothing to add to that because I agree with everything that Gabo has been saying. Brian mentioned work in Ukraine and I would love to hear more about his work there, not necessarily in this forum. It's hard not to speculate on the future of that country when this present tragic war is over. And I know Gabor has also been thinking about the impact uh, on Ukraine when it is integrated into the European Union. It becomes uh, what Don Kalp refers to as a vassal state. It is in some sense already a vassal state under the present Kiev elite. Um, I would just like to suggest, uh, maybe polemically, but if those German car makers that have been so important to the system of Orban in Hungary, if Audi and Mercedes and BMW uh, find it rational from the point of view of maximizing their profits to relocate to the Ukraine, Western or Central Ukraine, perhaps not too far east, um, that would be a major structural change in the configuration that Gabor has analyzed in his book. That might be a catalyst for political change. And the other factor, obviously, although I agree with Gabor that we should not exaggerate the, 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 the personal charisma. Orban is very skillful. Um, not all Hungarians find him charismatic by any means. And he is not as young as he used to be. And there is no obvious successor. I'm glad that Gabor mentioned the name of Jurcan, his opponent over so many years. But when both of those guys are off the stage, then the field will be open and the mayor of Budapest is still young enough to have a chance. I too was disappointed um, that he did not take a, a possibility this time around, but maybe he knows what he's doing. And he also has some uh, not negligible green credentials. Come back to the point about green transformation, which I think potentially does have an appeal in, in many sections of Hungarian society because of that natural endowment that I referred to at the very start. Hungarians do care about their natural environment and uh, candidacy by the mayor of Budapest. Four years from now, I think that's a possibility at least. Great. Uh, thank you. Any last questions here? Uh, Flora, did you, you have the time if you want. You wanted mm. to? No, I thought you were <clears throat> raising your hand. No, you can ask. I think you have a question. Did no, I, I think um, I, yeah. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sorry, I thought that you were. Uh, no, but this was, this was, I think, really, did you want to ask? Well, well, I was actually waiting to hear the answer to the question about Pagliani. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. <laughs> Which That's I, one, yeah. Would, I would be yeah. interested in the response to that. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. I, yeah. <laughs> So I think Chris will have uh, something to say on that too, um, but I, I, I really think that Polanyi is, is very useful uh, to understanding what's, what's, uh, what's happening, um, not just in Eastern Europe, but in general, uh, to understand the dynamics of global integration and local disintegration and how this is an embedding, disembedding uh, kind of uh, double movement that creates then all sorts of problems. So as, a, as an overarching historical framework, very powerful, very good historical parallels uh, by Polanyi. So very important elements. What, what I'm generally missing, and, and not just me, but, but, but others, and I think maybe Chris has even pointed out this in some of his publications, that at this macro level, this is a bit functionalistic. So, uh, you always need, you know, the, the actors and the social coalitions that 
that make the double movement an active thing. And there, Polanyi is not so powerful. So what I think we need is, is identifying the social coalitions. But I think that's doable. You can combine a kind of Polanyian framework with an open relational approach to class. So not an economically deterministic class, but a politically, culturally sensitive understanding of what class is. This is not there in Polanyi. You will have to read Chris Hahn and other contemporary anthropologists to, to get this, this idea of what a relational understanding of class is. But I think these can really come together neatly in, in a qualitative or cultural political economic uh, framework and, and offer a very, very powerful way to, to understand global integration and local disintegration and all the political negative consequences that come with it. Well, again, I, I basically agree. Uh, it is possible to read Polanyi in a variety of ways, and in some ways he may have changed his views uh, over the decades, from the young radical liberal before the First World War in Budapest, where he grew up, uh, to the emigre in the 1950s, who, who defends the Soviet Union, even in its Stalinist phase. Polanyi is a complex figure, but I understand him as basically an anti-evolutionist humanist. He has a, an inspiration that is rather similar to that of Marx in terms of his critique of capitalism, commodity fetishism. Um, but he avoids the technological determinisms, the Promethean technology will solve our futures. Uh, he is more suspicious of the machine age, which makes him attractive to a generation where the Green New Deal uh, is one uh, very current slogan. Polanyi is, uh, is more helpful there than Karl Marx. But in Sweden, you only have to read Alf Hornborg uh, from Lund to get a, a flavor of what I think is, is one of the most powerful ways to read Polanyi. The political ecology of Alf Hornborg is, to my mind, um, a very satisfying alternative to those rigid elements in historical materialism that progressives need to move on from. So read Alf Hornborg. I read him recently. He's great. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, no more questions that uh, I forgot. This was an important one. So, um, yeah, thank you for this fascinating, timely um, discussion and seed for thought for us also. Um, yeah, no matter whether we work in Hungary or Ukraine or Nicaragua or, you know, uh, the UK, wherever. Um, yeah, it helps us also for, to recenter questions of liberalism and democracy in our own discussions on, on rural development and, and the politics of the environment in which we are interested in. So thank you again. And um, yeah, so and next time we'll invite you for, we usually we used to have these uh, seminars with a, what they call here, or we call here, fika, which is like a small, you know, coffee with cakes, and so we we owe you that uh, next time we come to the fika. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am personally looking forward to having coffee and cakes uh, with you. I will perhaps have a coffee here, but it's not the same. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for me too. I will look forward to joining you on some other occasion. And my very best wishes to Ildiko. I, I hope um, to meet her on some future occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.